Na minha escola, cada aula me leva mais longe. Aprender lá me abre as portas do mundo todo. Do Canadá para onde eu quiser ir. A gente aprende brincando. A gente aprende investigando. We learn in two languages. We learn for life. That's the conclusion of my work. E a gente ama aprender onde quer que a gente esteja. Na Maple Bear, o aprendizado é para a vida, com o ensino multicultural que prepara seu filho para ser bem sucedido em qualquer lugar no Brasil e no exterior. Escola bilíngue com imersão em inglês e uma das melhores metodologias do mundo. Maple Bear, escola canadense de verdade. Uh, I think Alexandre, yes. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Alexandre Savag. I'm the vice president of the CBC. The Chamber of Commerce Brazil Canada is in partnership with the University of Montreal are pleased to present you the tech journey. This project brought together five master classes taught by renowned professors from the Université de Montréal. Tonight, we will listen to Professor Pierre Larouche. Dr. Larouche is Professor of Law and Innovation at the Faculty of Law at the Université de Montréal. I would like to thank you all for attending and with no further ado, I have the honor to call Dr. Larouche who will talk more about law and new technologies. Dr. Larouche, the stage is yours, please. Thank you, thank you. Uh, boa noite, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. I, I wish uh, I could be with you uh, in person, but uh, things being what they are, we have to do this remotely. Uh, but I, I can tell you the next best thing to being in Brazil is, is working with Brazilians. So uh, I have two colleagues here, uh, originally from Brazil, uh, uh, working with me at Université de Montréal, Carla Cristiano, thank you for your help in organizing uh, this evening. I'm, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share some thoughts with you uh, on uh, the interplay between law and, and new technologies. So if you don't mind, I will set up my slides. It will just take a second. So there we are, beautiful campus of Université de Montréal. Today, you would see it with some snow on it. Um, so I was asked to talk about this relationship between law and, and new technology. So you see uh, two languages, not three languages on the slide. Uh, and I've chosen to focus on, on one specific story. And it's, uh, I think, also a an uplifting story in, in these days uh, where things seem to be so uh, somber. Uh, it's the comeback of public authorities uh, as regards GAFAM regulation. So the story of, of how 
uh, we are now uh, in Europe and in the US uh, uh, starting to try to do something to put some discipline on the GAFA. So uh, the outline of my talk is, is the following. So first of all, of course, the question, well, what are we talking about with GAFAM? I think most of you are familiar with the acronym, but nonetheless, we will look at this. Then uh, we will look at what I mean by comeback of public authorities, uh, the, the challenges and the background to what is happening. And then we will do more detailed legal stuff. So the choice of instruments, the, the regulatory scheme, uh, and uh, we will then at the end start linking with broader issues. So the interplay with innovation and with broader societal issues before I will move to my conclusions. So the presentation tonight is based on three recent publications with uh, my colleague, Professor Destrel from Namur in Belgium, uh, all from uh, this year. One is not out yet actually. And, uh, you know, you will think, oh, is the professor is recycling this stuff in three different publications. Uh, you have to trust me. Uh, they're actually really different. <laughs> and we've been working on the, this new Digital Markets Act quite a lot. And for the presentation tonight, I've added also the American uh, initiatives. So GAFA, what are we talking about? So that's GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. Uh, but it is a moving target. So uh, all I can tell you is that this year, some people are going to have a big bonuses at Microsoft because the M is almost out of the equation. So it's the GAFA really. So Microsoft is kind of now, kind, you know, it's successfully portraying itself as a has been in terms of regulatory problems. So the four here are really at the focus of attention. And as we know, uh, Google is now called Alphabet. And uh, since uh, a couple of weeks, Facebook wants to be known as Meta. Uh, that would give us the AMA. So that doesn't sound very nice. So if you allow me, we will stick to GAFAM or GAFA uh, for the presentation. Uh, but beyond that, what's the common features? Uh, they're all firms that have massive platforms uh, and also services that are related to these platforms that evolve around the platforms. So uh, if we talk about Google, for instance, or Alphabet, the platforms are well known. It's the search engine, uh, YouTube, Android on mobile phones and Google Play. Uh, and of course, behind all of this, there's this huge online advertising platform that feeds <laughs> into these, uh, the search engine, YouTube, Android, and of course makes most, if not all of the money that Google makes. And next to that, uh, you know, if you go on the website, there's like 60 plus services that evolve around this. I've just listed a few that we're all familiar with, Gmail, Google Maps, Chrome, the Chrome operating system with the Chromebooks, Google Docs, Google Flights, uh, Meet, Google Shopping, and so on. Um, then Apple is best known for uh, as, as a platform for iOS, so the system that makes the iPhone and the iPad and, and the watch and the TV thing run. And with it comes the App Store. But as we know, Apple also makes devices. It makes and it sells this movie service, uh, music service, Apple News, and so on. Facebook. Uh, now called Meta is perhaps the most uh, most important uh, platform player because it has a number of these massive platforms. So Facebook itself, the social network, Messenger that runs on Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. Uh, for most of you, uh, I hope it's not a surprise, but Facebook owns Instagram and owns WhatsApp. They bought them. Uh, and of course, the online advertising platform that runs on all of this. Uh, related services, fewer for Facebook and Marketplace is one. Uh, Amazon has, of course, this huge platform that is used for e-commerce to buy stuff online. It started as a book selling site and now it sells everything to everyone. Uh, what fewer people know is that behind this platform, <laughs> there's a, something called Amazon Web Services. 
and it's the number one player in cloud computing. So uh, Amazon does a huge business and a lot of profit just selling computer capacity. And so many of you, for instance, use Dropbox. Uh, Dropbox is actually housed on Amazon services. I think even the uh, music service of Apple runs on Amazon. Okay. And Apple, uh, Amazon, of course, has lots of related services. So Amazon Basics, uh, the Amazon Marketplace, Fulfillment by Amazon. It looks like a feature, but it's actually a service. The merchants buy the services of Amazon to get their goods to you, Amazon Prime, and so on. And last, Microsoft has, Microsoft is the historical <laughs> player. That's where the idea of platforms came, came up from. Uh, of course, Windows, Office, Microsoft also owns Skype, LinkedIn, and is the num number two player for cloud uh, computing. Uh, and also as, by way of related services, Bing, games, and, and business applications. Are there more? platforms like this, uh, of course, uh, but these ones always stand out. And if you want to look at their common feature from a business perspective, and uh, here I take its inspiration from the work of my colleague uh, Petit, Nicolas Petit, uh, they're all huge. Uh, so uh, Google, uh, Apple, and Amazon, all three of them at some point in the last year were worth more than a thousand billion uh, dollars. So it's like figures that are out, outside of our imagination, of our yeah, imagination powers. They're all diversified, so they do a lot of things. They're all firms that are recognized for strategic long-term perspectives. Uh, they all seek growth, sometimes even at the expense of profitability, even though by now they're all profitable. Uh, they're all firms that are known for uh, innovation, so they explore and they try to find new stuff. They always bring new services, and they're known to be flexible. Uh, it's amazing sometimes, if you look at the size of the firms, how quickly they can change their business model. Uh, Amazon, in particular, is very nimble. So these firms used to have a very good perception, but it's changed in recent years. Um, why is that? Well, you know, we could spend hours on this, but there's some intrinsic factors, uh, essentially the fact that scandals have been piling up on, you know, in the press and on the, on the desks of the authorities, Cambridge Analytica, uh, you know, uh, theft of uh, personal information, uh, the influence on, on elections and so on. Uh, and there's some factors also that have nothing to do with the platforms themselves, but uh, with COVID, everyone could see if we didn't know this already, then we realized how essential these platforms are to our lives. I mean, we're no longer, it's no longer essential just to society or to the market, it's even essential to our lives. Uh, so that triggered also uh, uh, a reflection on, well, shouldn't we do something about these platforms then if they are so essential, but they don't always uh, do uh, good. <laughs> so I gave you here two quotes uh, that uh, from recent documents in the US. And the first one is coming straight from a report of the House of Representatives. Uh, to put it simply, companies that once were scrappy underdog startups that challenged the status quo have become the kinds of monopolies that we last saw in the era of oil barons and railroad tycoons. And one I especially like uh, from the a complaint against Google, very crisp, very powerful. Two decades ago, Google became the darling of Silicon Valley as a scrappy startup with an innovative way to search the emerging internet. That Google is long gone. Okay, so this shows you what the mood is amongst the public authorities at the moment. So that's why my talk is called Comeback by Public Authorities. So what are we talking about in, by in terms of comeback? The first thing to know is the public authorities were never very far. They never left the scene entirely, but in the US at least, they were on the sidelines. They were letting the firms do a lot of things without intervention. 
Uh, and what changed was this report that I quoted from a minute ago by uh, the antitrust subcommittee of the House of Representatives uh, on the 6th of October, 2020. So that's just a month before the election. Uh, but the political signal was clear. Uh, this was a report that the Democrats and the Republicans agreed upon. It, technically, it's coming from the Democrats, but everyone knows that the Republicans agreed with the report. So that report was a signal to everyone in the US that there is convergence between the two major parties. So there are a few things in the US where the Democrats and the Republicans agree. One of them is we need to do something about the GAFA. And it's, it's like someone opened the door, you know, within two months, between October and December 2020, there were three lawsuits against Google, two against Facebook, filed by the Department of Justice and by the state authorities. So everyone is going after them. Apple is stuck in court in private claims. Uh, you might have heard, it's the case by Epic. The, the maker of Fortnite challenging the, the, the way the app store works. Amazon also is uh, faced with lawsuits. So they're all in front of court now. And on top of that, uh, with the new Congress this year, there have been legislative initiatives to, to uh, not just do cases, but also change the law. And there are two initiatives, two lines of, of doing this. One is in the Senate. Uh, and it's led by Senator Klobuchar from Minnesota. And, and she's pushing for a reform of antitrust law. Uh, the bill was tabled in February of 2021 and it hasn't moved much so far. Uh, there's a second track and that track is uh, in front of the House of Representatives, uh, legislation that is not doing antitrust reform but presenting or putting forward specific law that would deal with these platforms, with the GAFA. And they've been filed by Democratic representatives, but always with co-sponsors from the Republican Party. Uh, four bills in particular that were tabled last June, and we will come back to them. On the other side of the Atlantic, in the EU, uh, so the Euro European Commission and the competition authorities were always applying the law. So Google has lost three cases in 2017, 18, and 19. Uh, the commission fined a total of about 10 billion euros. And uh, uh, so Google has challenged these and has, all, has lost its challenge against the first decision. Uh, Facebook has been in trouble in front of the German competition authority. We'll come back to that at the end. Uh, Apple, Amazon are all in front of the competition authorities as well. So there's never been a break in Europe. <laughs> but there as well, you had a shift to something more in December 2020. So the European Commission said, hey, let's do a specific regulation on contestable and fair markets in the digital sector called the Digital Markets Act or DME. I will call it the DME from now on. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the Portuguese title, but of course it exists in a Portuguese version. Uh, and it's now uh, before the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament. And I can tell you last week, both institutions signaled that in principle, they, would, they were willing to adopt this. There's gonna be some changes, but the core principles are agreed. So it's expected that by the summer of next year, so, in seven or eight months, this will be law. Okay, the US legislation, it's not so clear what will happen. It's always difficult to predict, but in the EU, this will happen. Okay, so there's going to be a change in the regulation of the GAFA on both sides of the Atlantic. So what are the big challenges uh, that are facing these authorities? So there, there are two big challenges, two big questions. Uh, the first one is simply getting back into the game. So reasserting the power of public authorities towards these huge platforms, these massive firms. That's more of a procedural or political issue. And, and then there's the issue in, in law. <laughs> what do we want to do? Where do we go? And how you address these challenges, I would argue, 
depends on how you see the nature of the platform or their ontology, their being. <laughs> Are these platforms, are, is, is Google, uh, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, as we know them now, are they some kind of unavoidable consequences of economic forces? Or are they the result of some political and historical contingencies? Okay, and it, a lot will hinge on this. But first, let's explore this a bit deeper. Okay. Uh, I like this drawing, uh, but it, it doesn't illustrate what I'm saying, but it, it looks good. Uh, the, essentially, the, if you look for the immediate cause, the proximate cause of the emergence of GAFA, it has to be found as what is called platform economics. Okay, for those of you who are familiar with this, uh, I'll try to explain it quickly, but for the others, you need to understand a few things. First of all, all these services are uh, have extreme economies of scale. You know, it will cost a lot of money to put the search engine together, but once the search engine that Google put together is working, whether it's used by one person, 10 person, a thousand person, a million or billion persons, it doesn't cost much more. It costs more computing power maybe, but adding an extra person doesn't cost much. So the marginal cost is, is not that much. And it's the same for all of the services. So it's easy to scale up. Then you have the famous network effects. And that's why the drawing is, is a bit, it's nice, but it doesn't quite describe what is going on. Essentially, you need the drawing like this to understand what is going on. Uh, so imagine you're, uh, well, here, eBay is used as an example. You could use Amazon also. Uh, if I am a buyer, where would I go to buy stuff online? To some extent, it's interesting for me to be in a place where there's a lot of buyers because uh, presumably then there's more volume, the prices are going to be better because there's a lot of buyers. Plus I benefit from looking at what the others are doing. I benefit from their product reviews, from just observing what they are doing. So the more buyers you have, the better it is. Now look at the sellers. If I'm selling stuff online, it makes sense to be where the other sellers are because I, you know, I, there's, it's a bigger platform. There's room for my product and I can be next to my competitors. So I have a better chance of showing why my product is so good, okay? Or why my competitors are so bad. So already buyers will attract more buyers and seller will attract more sellers. But the, on top of that, the two sides reinforce one another. Because if I know that there are lots of sellers, then I will go there because that's where the choice is the biggest uh, as a buyer. And once the sellers know that the buyers are all going on Amazon, then they will all go on Amazon as well because that's where the buyers are. And this reinforces itself. And ultimately, then what you get is a monopoly. The own, uh, and, and these platforms typically, so they're multi-sided platforms, so they have more sides and the sides feed one another. And the aim for the platform is to create dependency and, and lock-in. Okay, think here of Facebook, for instance, you will invest, or Instagram, you will have invested a lot of time to create your profile, put up your pictures and all of this, uh, and you cannot take this anywhere. So there's a lock-in effect. And, and normally network effects are not too bad if there is multi-homing, if you can be on more than one platform. But for these services, for all sorts of reasons, we tend not to be on more than one platform often because it's just too much work to be, you know, you don't, if you spend all your time having a nice Instagram profile, you're not going to do this on four different platforms. It's just too much work, okay? The only place where you have a bit of multi-homing maybe would be the search engine, but even then, you know, we don't do three searches. It's, it's a lot of work. So we tend to stick to one platform. And on top of that, the platforms have what are called data-driven advantages because they have mountains of data and that also gives them a competitive advantage. 
uh, by the way, uh, a very interesting debate in, in competition law circles is whether the advantage comes from the mountain of, of data or from the fact that you have superior capacity to figure out what to do with it. But we'll leave this for another day or for the discussion period. So this is the setting. Now, these features that I just described, the network effects, the economies of scale, uh, they're also present in other areas where there's no GAFA. Again, the example in the previous slide, eBay, uh, PayPal, you know, there are other platforms that are not GAFA. So what happened for these GAFA to appear? So I'll take you back to the early 21st century. Uh, I use this comic here as an illustration from Delbert. And this was the mood at the time. So uh, I cannot see how old my audience is, but some of you might have remembered this. In the early 2000s, venture capital was widely available and the venture capitalists were sometimes happy just to put money into things that might give them some return. And, and that's how the GAFAM came to be. Uh, they had generous support from venture capital. They had all the money that they could dream, Amazon, Google, and Facebook. Apple is another story, but Amazon, Google, Facebook. Um, and the investors saw that these firms were getting huge. You know, Google, Facebook were taking the whole market by storm. So they got all the money they wanted because of the growth in the user base. And the business plan was secondary, if not superfluous. If you remember well, uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, they lost a lot of money when they started. They were growing their user base, like Facebook was already in the billion of users. It still had not done $1 of profit. So they eliminated the competition, they grew immensely, and then people turned around and said, okay, well, we now we need to make some money. And that gave us, of course, advertising-based platforms, which is not necessarily the best thing for humanity. Second thing, our public authorities, I don't know about Brazil, but I would suspect it's the same thing in Brazil. Everywhere, I'm sorry, the authorities were too complacent. So these startups were seen as, as we saw in the previous slide, like scrappy startups doing something in innovative. So they were left alone. They were even protected. If you look at the liability for the intermediaries, they, they had a special status. And everyone thought whatever happens on the internet, all these services, it's super competitive. It's like the far west, there's no need to do anything there. And these network effects 20 years ago, people knew about this, but everyone thought this was a problem at the physical network stage. So we, we needed to spend time making sure that we had many providers of cellular network and, and so on, but what happened on the network was, was fine. So we kind of forgot about this. And, and, and to be honest, if you look back, these markets could have evolved differently. Uh, if you look, for instance, at the market for mobile phones, for, for smartphones, you see what we have is a standard, like 4G, 5G, and so on. And the competition takes place around that standard, and it's a very competitive market. You have a number of manufacturers, you have wide choice, and there's not that much of a worry about uh, dominance at the handset level. Uh, you have other uh, services like cellular services. Uh, in Canada, we have three providers, four in some places in the US, three, four. So it varies. It's usually three or four, uh, but these are also competing uh, on the basis of which has the best plan and so on. But typically, their networks interconnect. If you're a subscriber of uh, the first provider, you can call your friends on the second provider, it will work. You know, we never thought about this for Facebook. If you're on Facebook, you cannot connect with any other social network. It's not part of the deal. So we let these markets, the GAFAM markets, we let them evolve without doing anything. And then we got the GAFAM. So uh, you think, I think you see where this takes me. So if the GAFAM were the result of some kind of preordained process, Dutton, you could argue, well, we should just accept this. You know, it's economic forces that we cannot do anything about, and we should try to achieve the best possible outcome under these circumstances. 
So what you would see is a very aggressive political reassertion of the power of authorities over GAFAM, and then a very direct intervention. You would tell them, okay, we're going to supervise your business very closely in the public interest. But there's another way. I tried to show you in the last minutes that uh, it's not inevitable, unavoidable. I think GAFAM arose out of a, a coincidence of a number of contingent factors. It's, it, there's some history. <laughs> so maybe we can try to correct past mistakes. We maybe we cannot rewrite history, but at least correct the mistakes. So what you would see then is the public authorities reasserting themselves a little bit more indirectly. They would try to work on the factors to try to restore uh, or you know, bring the markets elsewhere. And the intervention would be not to tell the GAFAM what to do, but to change the way the market works. Uh, my argument is that uh, what we're seeing on both sides of the Atlantic is the second of these two. So we're kind of giving competition a last chance before we start regulating closely these players. Okay, so if you look at what is going on in Europe and in the US, this is what you see, uh, sorry. The starting point is competition or antitrust in the US. It was always applied in the EU and in the US, uh, the Senate bill tries to make antitrust law more easily applicable. Why do you want to do this? Well, the law is well established. We know the law. The enforcement authorities have been around, they know their business, and the remedies under antitrust are powerful. At the same time, what we see with the DMA in Europe and with the bills before the House in the US is that people are not so happy to use competition law only. Uh, in the DMA proposal, the commission explains why. And it's, it's like some kind of, uh, it's the case against competition law, if you want. I think a lot of it is exaggerated, but there is one criticism that sticks and it's the same criticism in the US. It's competition law takes too long and the procedures are too time extensive and labor extensive. It takes too much work to get competition law to be applied. Think about it, the commission has been fighting with Google for 12 years now. Uh, and it ties up a lot of resources because Google has endless resources. They can pay all the lawyers that they want, all the economists that they want, all the lobbyists that they want. And the commission is kind of, oh, we only have 10 people to work on this and it's already a lot. So there, the commission in Europe and the US authorities, they find it's just too long. So what do they suggest? Something different, but something that is not regulation in the sense of we tell the firms what to do uh, in great detail. So if you look at the bills before the US House of Representatives and the DMA, they're both presented as kind of regulation, but it's, it's just packaging. If you look inside, they are full of concepts and tools from competition law, uh, except that instead of being applied on a case-by-case -case basis, it's put in a more general wrapping like regulation where we just say, okay, this is the definition and these are the obligations and this is what you do. Okay, so it's kind of a, a mixed uh, approach. You take the intellectual content from competition law, but you apply it with the let's say the vehicle of regulation. And of course, this creates epistemological issues. If you want to be like at a more theoretical level, uh, competition law, antitrust, there's a reason why cases have to be fought. It's because the law is general and it's only if you fight these cases that the authority improves its analysis and gets to a, a level of decision that is satisfactory because we don't want the authorities to be you know, completely left without any control. So the fact that the authorities need to fight these cases is, is good uh, for the quality of the decision-making. And, and here we kind of 
you know, the, it's too long, it's too expensive to fight cases for 10 years. I understand this, but we go straight to the other end. Uh, we put into the law uh, concepts and, and, and thoughts that are simply what the people think in their offices without having really tested them. So th there's going to be an issue on this. Uh, but nonetheless, let's take a closer look at what is going on on both sides of the Atlantic. So far, so good. Anyway, we can have a discussion and questions uh, later on. So let me tell you a little bit more about the content of what is happening. Uh, so again, I told you in terms of objectives, we're not far from competition law. So the, you, uh, the EU uh, DMA says it's about contestable and fair markets. To me, this looks like something that could come out of competition law. And the US bills in the house, they say, well, it's about promoting competition and economic opportunities. It's also competition law language. But the mechanism is very regulatory. So both instruments are similar. Uh, I think honestly that the US looked at what the Europeans were doing. The Europeans went first, but the structures are very similar. Uh, in both instruments, you have essentially a definition of the scope of the instrument. Then within that definition, within that scope, some firms are being identified uh, as regulatory targets. And then you specify what the consequences are. So the mechanics are fairly simple and, and you can predict that there's going to be a huge battle on which firms are covered, okay? The concepts that are used have different names. So we call them online platforms in the US. In the EU, it's core platform services or Serviso Essencial de Plataforma, pardon my pronunciation for uh, Portuguese. Uh, in the US, the firms are called covered platform. This is one of the, it's a meaningless name. It's just to share, say that they've been singled out. In the EU, they're called gatekeepers in English. The French and the Portuguese translation is not as strong. It's the controlador de acceso, controller d'accès. Uh, but anyway, the English name says it all. It's the gatekeeper. And then uh, we have obligations in the various bills. So I, I want to spend a bit of time to explain to you the mechanics of this. You will see it, it's there are some differences, but the, the lines are roughly uh, aligned. So in Europe, which platforms are targeted? They're the core platform services, okay? And there's a list in the legislation and it's exhaustive and it's limited. So they're all there and they're all listed. There is no chapeau, there's no general clause. And look at the list, online intermediation services, search engines, social networking, video sharing, interpersonal communication services, operating system, cloud computing, and the advertising that goes with this. If you go back to the page earlier, I think everything is there. So this, if you add up, it's, it's uh, spells uh, GAFA. Okay, the list can be extended, but not shortened uh, in the proposal. Then, uh, who gets uh, within the, the realm of core platform services, who gets singled out to be regulated? They're the, the gatekeepers. And here the gatekeepers is something that the commission will figure out and they need to investigate the, the markets. So what is a gatekeeper? Three criteria, uh, significant impact on the internal market, uh, operates a, a core platform services that serves as an important gateway to the end users and entrenched and durable position. Okay, for all of these criteria, the DMA gives us more specific presumptions. So significant impact is presumed if you have a turnover of more than 6.5 billion euros in the EU or market capitalization of more than 65 billion euros and you're present in more than three member states. Uh, the important gateway is presumed if you have more than 45 million monthly active end users and more than 10,000 yearly active business users in the EU. 
And this should have been met in the last three years for a presumption to arise that it's entrenched and durable. Again, if you do the math, you realize, first of all, the GAFA easily meet the threshold, but there might be others. So, and the commission has been telling us uh, there are about 10 firms that fall into that category. No one quite knows what the, who the others are, uh, but in part, I think it has to do with uh, the commission wants to avoid the impression that this is targeted specifically at GAFA. So the thresholds are actually low if you look at it. Uh, and these uh, gatekeepers will be reviewed. So the designation will be reviewed every other year. In the US, similar structure. First of all, the scope is online platforms. Uh, and here as well, you just look at websites, online or mobile applications, operating system, digital assistance, online services that enable sharing content or interacting with content, facilitate transactions, or enable search or queries. If you put this all together, it also spells GAFA. So it's again, the services that these platforms offer. Then, uh, which ones will be singled out? A similar idea in the US, but the thresholds are higher. So the platforms that are singled out are called cover platforms, covered. Uh, and they're based on the following criteria. At least at some point in the last year, more than 50 million monthly active users. Same thing, more than 100,000 active business users. And at some point in the last two years, the sales or the capitalization was higher than $600 billion, okay? And it's a critical trading partner for a product or service offered or directly related to the online platform. Now, if you look at these thresholds, they're higher than in Europe. And, and if you look at it closely, I don't think that uh, uh, you know, the four GAFA will go through but I don't think that many other firms qualify. You know, no firm has achieved sales above 600 billion per year, but market capitalization, yes, but it's, it's high. I think I'm not even sure. Facebook barely qualifies. And then uh, Apple, Google, uh, and Amazon do, okay? So this is what happens. So there's going to be in the EU about 10, platforms, in the US probably only four, and then obligations are imposed. So if you look at this, you can see there's a, a diagnosis that's been made that uh, the firms are misbehaving. The problem is a behavior problem, okay? Uh, and the behavior that is problematic, uh, if you try to classify it with more general concept, uh, that's what you get. So the most problematic behavior is called self-preferencing. And, and we've all experienced it as users, is when the platform favors its own related services at the expense of competitors of these services. Okay, example, you're on Google and uh, you look for a restaurant. Okay, you're going to get the restaurant reviews of Google it's going to be difficult to get those of Yelp or TripAdvisor, even though sometimes they're better because Google puts its own reviews first, okay? If you go to Amazon, uh, you try to buy something, it will tell you, hey, we've got this Amazon basics for you and the others are further below. Uh, bundling, so the platform forces you to buy more than one service together uh, when they could be offered separately. Okay, so everyone says uh, on Apple, uh, I buy the iPhone. Uh, why do I have to buy my apps or get my apps through the App Store? Couldn't I have a choice of App Store? But Apple says, no, no, you get the iPhone, you get the operating system and the App Store. This is all coming together. There's no discussion, there's no choice. Um, barriers to user mobility. Uh, Again, to use the example of Apple, uh, Apple says, well, if you're going to do business with the apps that you sell on the App Store, the business has to run through Apple. You cannot 
take people outside of the Apple environment to sell them stuff. Okay, or if you do, then it's very complicated as anyone has experienced. If you are, uh, if you have Kindle on your iPad or your iPhone and you find a book that you want to buy, you cannot buy it right now. You have to go in your browser, go on Amazon and it, it gets complicated. That's because Apple says, no, no, if you sell something through the Kindle app, then we need to take a 30% commission. And Amazon says, no. Okay, this is at the core of the, uh, epic uh, litigation as well in, in the EU, in the US. Uh, fourth typical problem is exploitation of users. So anything that goes on the Apple store, including the sales also of music, movies, and so on, is 30%, 30% commission for Apple. Google Play, 30% commission for Google. And again, a lot of manufacturers, uh, software manufacturers are saying, well, this makes no sense. Why 30%? It's way too high. Uh, another big problem that has been observed is, uh, and, and you've seen so far, we haven't talked much about, much about Facebook, but the big problem with Facebook has been its merger policy. It's bought WhatsApp, Instagram, and it's taken a lot of time to realize, but it's part of the strategy to avoid that competitors come too close to Facebook. So it's called the kill zone strategy. If you are starting to be a competitor, I will buy you and then turn you into part of my firm or just destroy you. Okay, so this is also problematic. Okay, and I put also lack of transparency, access to data, they're not as central, but they're there as well. And, and, and so what the DMA does in Europe is simply all of these things, you have obligations to counter this and, and they're all taken from competition cases or from policy or academic studies on the application of competition law. So it's directly taken from competition law. And the same in the bills before the US Congress. So it's spread over four bills, but one of them has a prohibition on discrimination, which looks very much like the DMA. And this one is also before the Senate has a good chance of being adopted. There's another one that says, hey, if you're a GAFA, you cannot buy anyone. You cannot buy any other firm unless you prove that it, there's no risk at all for competition. So the bill reverses the presumption in mergers and acquisitions. And this one is also before the House and the Senate. So it has a chance. And you have two other bills that are less advanced. May maybe they will not be uh, enacted. One is to ensure the data portability and data security. And the other one is very radical. The uh, Ending Platform Monopolies Act would require the firms to divest uh, their uh, competing or their, their co uh, um, connected products. So uh, for instance, uh, Amazon would have to get rid of its retailing activities on its platform, which is quite far going. So why is it just a question of behavior? Why don't we do anything more radical than just changing the behavior of the platforms? I think part of it has to do with the fact that it's in the nature of competition law to focus on behavior and we are within the orbit of competition law. Nonetheless, and I've written this in some of the pieces, you could have had more structural obligations. I mean, if you're gonna say this isn't really competition law, we present this as regulation, you might as well use the tools. And you could have had obligations of interoperability, for instance, to tell Facebook, well, you have to make it possible for another social network to connect to Facebook and, and communicate. We don't care how, you just do it. And uh, I think if you're serious about correcting the past, you, you have to go there. You cannot just change the behavior. And one type of remedies that is not known to competition law, but would have been useful is what I call the governance remedies. So if you think that there are problems with the way the app store is run, well, why not run the app store as if it was a standard, as if it was 4G? So you get all the stakeholders around the table and they decide how the app store is run. It's still owned by Apple, the money goes to Apple, but the way it's run is decided by everyone together. And uh, on mer mergers and acquisitions, 
as I was saying, the EU is a bit lagging behind on this. So um, in the last minutes, I will just open up on two questions. The first one is how, how about innovation? Uh, and, and why it's important is because one of the core arguments that the GAFAM lobbyists uh, serve to the US and the EU authorities is um, what you're doing is, is going to kill innovation. Uh, we are innovative firms. Uh, you're just going to destroy our incentives by putting us in the straitjacket and forcing us to work with our competitors. First problem with that line of argument is that if you look at the empirical evidence, uh, they're not as innovative as they used to be. We're kind of peaking. And if you look at the th theory behind this, and, and you know, then it's close to the stuff I do as a researcher, uh, innovation is not just having a great idea, it's having a great idea and getting it accepted by society. And if society, if customers cannot choose because there's no competition, then there's no diffusion or adoption within the meaning of the theory. So, you know, we don't know if it's really innovative or not. If people have no choice, <laughs> they have to take it. Uh, and the dominant firms, so the, the GAFAs, all say, yeah, but what we do is always in the interest of consumer. We know that consumers want this. We know that consumers want to have this new feature. Yes, that's what you say, <laughs> but that doesn't mean that it's true. And it's something that if you look closely in the decisions of the commission in Microsoft and in Google, the commission picks up on this and it says, look, you tell us that what you're doing is in the interest of consumers, you're innovative, and that's what consumers want. It would be more convincing if we had proof that the consumers are actually choosing, that they have a choice and they choose your product, as opposed to you telling us this is what consumers want. So I'm not convinced about the innovation line of argument. But beyond that, there's the issue, you know, Leaving aside the lobbying, is it really bad for innovation? So we spent time on this, uh, Alexandre Destrel and I, and it's, it's complicated, <laughs> but there are many types of innovation that can happen in this sector. Uh, the first one is what you would call incremental innovation. So the platform is there and you have innovation around it. Think the App Store. The App Store is very innovative. There's all sorts of stuff happening and it runs on the platform, the, the operating system. So that's what you call competition in the market. And, and that part is really reasonably well covered. You know, essentially the bills in the US and the DME in the EU, they protect the players against appropriation through the operator. But that's not the only innovation there is. I mean, when the DME says we want to have contestable market, it means that they also would like to have competition uh, on the platform. You know, they would like the platform operator sometimes to, to, be, uh, to face competition to replace it. So kind of radical innovation. Uh, the problem here is that it's not realistic. I mean, no one I think is going to replace the Google search engine by another search engine just better. And you're not going to replace Facebook by another social network just better. Uh, so what you have typically is more disruptive innovation, the third one, which is not frontal, but sidelines. So you redefine the market and redefine it in such a way that you be, you're in the middle and the former monopolist is on the side. Now think about it. Microsoft is still a monopolist. Microsoft is still like 95% of the operating system on PCs. Office is everywhere also, but no one worries about it too much. Why? Because it's not where the action is. <laughs> so uh, Google of all uh, firms successfully uh, managed to turn everyone's attention to the browser and the internet as the place where the action is. And later on, then we had the smartphones and the iPads that turned us away from the computers. So this is disruptive innovation. And of course, there's no clear indication that people who drafted the DMA or the bills in the US thought about this, uh, yet it is important. 
what you can say is that disruptive innovation can start as incremental or radical and then turn disruptive. So in that sense, it's not too bad. The two proposals on the, both sides of the Atlantic uh, will not kill disruptive innovation. They just don't promote it. Uh, the only thing you can do to really protect or promote disruptive innovation is merger control. And that's what the EU doesn't do very well, but the US saw this. So one of the big mistakes that was made in the last 10 years is allowing Facebook to buy Instagram and WhatsApp. Because we always thought, oh, they're not competing. They're just different markets. But uh, the internal documents showed that Facebook ex saw exactly what was happening. And Facebook knew if anyone is going to challenge Facebook, they will probably be either WhatsApp or they will have bought WhatsApp to use it to challenge Facebook. So Facebook bought WhatsApp first. Okay. Uh, so we have these three scenarios and, and they're not all, they have trade-offs, of course. They, they, you can't have all of them probably, uh, but there's no evidence that any authority in the EU or the US thought about the trade-offs. But what we say in our piece is actually it doesn't matter. I mean, innovation is unpredictable. So uh, the authorities shouldn't try to be better than the firms. Just make sure that everything is possible and let the firms sort it out. Okay, last big point. Um, you might tell me, uh, Professor Laroche, you've just spoken for almost an hour, very nice, but uh, are we just losing track of the important things? You know, protection of privacy, democracy. I mean, GAFAM have an impact on this. <laughs> and, and you've been telling us about competitive behavior. Uh, my answer to this is twofold. The first one is uh, competition helps <laughs> on the other issues as well by uh, giving some choice to consumers. And if consumers can choose, then GAFAM will feel the pressure and they might change their behavior. Uh, you know, people do care about privacy, they care about democracy, they might go elsewhere, and then the competitive process will put pressure on the GAFAM. Of course, there is a, a fragmentation risk. You know, there's some advantage in having all the uh, weird fringe theories on Facebook because you can see them. If, the, if there's more competition, they're going to be somewhere in a smaller player. But then again, in a smaller player, they can do less damage. Uh, but for sure, if, if we give up on competition as a way of steering markets, then, then we need to intervene way more deeply than what we're doing now. And, and second line of argument is, if you're intelligent about the way you enforce competition law, you can in, introduce these considerations in the analysis. If you're looking for a case, and I will go a bit faster because it's, uh, it's getting late, but the Facebook case before the German Federal Cartel Office is a perfect example. What did the Germans say? They said, well, you're a dominant Facebook. There's no one else on the social network scene. So it's not as if customers had any choice. If they care about the protection of their personal data, their choice is Facebook or nothing. So it creates the situation where Facebook can offer uh, a deficient privacy policy or maybe a privacy policy that is not even compliant with the law and consumers have no other choice than to accept it. So the, 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 the stroke of genius in the reasoning is that <laughs> it's exploitative, but not in the way that we usually think about it, that the prices are too high, but rather in uh, having a bad, protection of uh, personal data or not cho no choice in, in privacy. Uh, and that case has been upheld by the German Supreme Court. And the second thing that gives me hope is in the two Google cases, the two big ones, uh, what is happening is that the commission is forcing Google to live by its policies, to live by its statements. In Google shopping, the commission says, you cannot say, your search engine is objective and it delivers the truth about the internet. <laughs> uh, and at the same time, uh, do manipulations behind the scene. You cannot do it. You cannot have your cake and eat it. Uh, and the same thing in Google Android, the commission tells Google, you cannot say Android is open source and then prohibit the people using Android, prohibit Samsung and Huawei from playing with it and from introducing variants of Android. 
this is not compatible. So uh, there is hope. So in conclusion, uh, so I hope I've shown you that strategic choices underpin uh, the comeback of the public authorities. It's not just the, you know, it's been thought through. Uh, the assumption is that the GAFAM are contingent and, and not something that is unavoidable. So you can try uh, competition law and try restoring competition in the markets first. Uh, you can see it. So the proposals on both sides of the Atlantic use the instruments and the concepts from competition law. The tough part is they try to put this into a regulatory vehicle. And, and, and that's another big argument of the GAFAM in their lobbying. They're saying, you cannot put us all in the same boat. You have to deal with us separately. And if you deal with them separately, of course, then we're back into competition law. Uh, so what we're doing here is a kind of managed competition. So we have these pieces of legislation that attempt to introduce some kind of general management of competition without going too deep into regulation. So it's very good also to see that uh, the US and the EU are, are converging. I think it's needed and it's, it's welcome. Uh, but where does that leave our two countries, Canada and Brazil? Um, I'm not too sure about where Brazil is on these issues, but I can tell you Canada is just not there. And you know, to be honest, maybe it's not that bad from a political perspective, because if the EU and the US agree and they do something that is consistent on both sides of the Atlantic, Canada can just say, well, look, we, we're going to do the same and you're going to give us the same. And I think Brazil could also free ride on the EU and the US efforts. But in the meantime, I think uh, it's worth paying attention to this and, and looking into this as an academic venture, uh, which brings me to the, the end of my presentation, which is uh, to invite you to study at Université de Montréal. And if you like these issues, you like these discussions, I'm not the only one. There's a bunch of us at the Faculty of Law uh, working on these issues, at least four other professors and PhD students and, and, and younger colleagues. Uh, so we will be happy to welcome you at Université de Montréal. It's a big university. It's the biggest one in Quebec in terms of teaching and, and research. Uh, it has a rich history, a, number, a large number of students. So it's, it's a big institution, but it's quite nimble because we're very much into the high-tech uh, area. Uh, and recently, we were ranked the 88th best university in the world. And I should add, the law school is above the university is always a good place to be. We're 51st in the world. So we have all of these. It's a general university. So we have management, law, uh, all matters of uh, social sciences, uh, natural sciences. So uh, we're open and welcome to, to everyone. Uh, and not only do you get a, a complete, a nice university where you, we work on all the key issues of today, uh, but you get to do this in Montreal. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, the world's best city or one of the best cities for international students. People love Montreal. There are many universities. Invested in Montreal is the largest, but it's not the only one. And it's a nice place to be. Uh, somehow we only give you pictures from the summer, but the, the winter is also quite nice. It's just different. And, and we would love to welcome you in Montreal. So there are some tools if you want to consider studying uh, with us. Uh, and I should add uh, also a, a more specific uh, mention at the end. At uh, the law school, there are two programs in particular where we uh, welcome uh, people from Brazil and we have welcomed some <laughs> of uh, your fellow uh, uh, citizens. Uh, first of all, a master's in business law in a global context, and I gave you the link to go there. And there's the PhD program that I'm uh, personally directing. It's a PhD in innovation, science, technology, and law, where uh, you know everything that I've been discussing today is squarely in the scope of the PhD, and we spend a lot of time on these issues. So we'd be happy to welcome you, uh, especially at the Faculty of Law, but Anywhere in the university, we were discussing today, again, how important Brazil is as a, a partner. And, and we're always happy to, uh, to welcome you and, and uh, integrate, include you in, in our academic community. So I'll stop here.
uh, stop sharing my slides and I'll be happy to uh, discuss the presentation, answer any questions. So first of all, thank you so much, Dr. LaRouche. It was a pleasure to have you sharing your knowledge with us today. And we actually have a few questions from the audience. And yep. the first one, okay. So should we have a perspective that the EU and U or US will promote a general regulation for the GFM or GEMAM and the rest of the world could sit waiting for it? Should other governments will less, uh, with less power promote it, it this change? What is Canada doing for this? Yeah, so, so the, um, there's the, let's say the theoretical and the practical side of this. The, the theoretical side is um, any government has the power to, to play in that uh, space and, and to, uh, to, to do its own uh, in, um, initiative to regulate the, the GAFAM. Uh, the question is how much leverage do the individual governments have uh, so it's not a bad strategy for Canada, but I, I'm not sure even it's a strategy. I think it's just the way it is. And, uh, the US and the EU have taken the lead and, and Canada is trying to follow, but in all likelihood, we will be late to have any, too late to have any influence, but we can always ask to have the same as what the US and the EU have achieved. Um, so, uh, and of course, in the ideal, in an ideal world, there would be some kind of international forum so that this, you know, other countries could have a say. But uh, let's be honest, uh, in the area of competition law, it's a US-EU game. And, and again, it's already quite something that the US and, e and the EU seem to be going in the same direction. Thank you so much. Um, we have another one here. So from a Canadian point of view, from a country that takes uh, that takes in account what happens everywhere, is um, in special what happened in the US, what could you indicate as possible clues for possible legal solutions for countries that are not in the European Union? Okay, so... Uh... Yeah, so if you look at this, uh, at this point, so the, I think the, the, the changes in the EU look like they will happen. And in the US, it's less certain. So if ever the US does not follow through, uh, then it's going to put countries like Canada in an interesting position. So it will be, do we you know, do what the US have done? So actually not take any initiative or try to apply competition law, or do we go the European way and try to have specific uh, legislation? Uh, in that sense, I, I, I would argue, uh, you know, there might be room for Canada to follow what is done in the EU. It would, in, it would entail, if the US doesn't do any legislation, it, there would be then a difference between the US and the Canadian uh, between U.S. law and Canadian law, and again, uh, you know, uh, the GAFA will say, "Oh, we will stop serving Canada, or we won't do the same in Canada." Uh, but I, you know, I'm not sure that these threats are very solid because, you know, it's still a big market, and, and you don't want to be completely cut off from Canada. Okay, and I think that we have the last one. Um, what is the difference of a regular law doctoral program and your doctoral program in innovation, technology, science, and law? Ah, so uh, it is like a, a branch within the program. If you are in the general program, then you get some general instruction in how to do PhD research, methodology, theory, and then you go on to develop your research question and you will then have uh, the, the, the exam whereby we give you the green light to go on and, and write your thesis. In the innovation stream, there's more courses. Uh, so there are especially two extra things. 
The first one is a seminar that I give personally uh, in the spring on innovation and law uh, to try also to get some sense of community amongst the students that we are working on similar issues. And then there's a summer school to get the students to start preparing and presenting their research uh, projects. Uh, so that, that's the difference. So the innovation uh, PhD is more centered on uh, innovation and, and law. It's also in English. The general PhD is, the courses are given in French. You can write in either language. The innovation stream is, uh, the courses are given in English. And of course you can write in French or English at your uh, leisure. So this, this is the difference. Uh, but in both cases, you get a PhD from the University of Montréal. Thank you so much, Professor. So um, do you have any last words? Uh, no, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to talk to you about this. I hope uh, you like these issues uh, as much as I do. I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's my career. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, welcome some of you if you want to do more work on this uh, in the course of PhD studies or a master's program. Uh, it would be very nice. Thank you so much, Dr. LaRouche. Uh, and now I'd like to call Alexandre Sabag again to deliver the closing remarks. Well, thank you so much, Dr. LaRouche. It was a pleasure to have you with us tonight, sharing your knowledge. Uh, I took, uh, have many takeaways from, from your speech, uh, from, from your lecture today. Just like innovation comprises not, not just an invention itself, but also diffusion and adoption by society. That, that's a very, very important thing. And all, and, and all the topics regarding competition. And I think the, you know, all the, the topics that you brought today to us are very, uh, you know, connected to, to all participants here. So I'm sure that everyone here enjoyed your master class and learned a lot about uh, law and, and new technologies. So again, uh, thank you for, for accepting your, our invitation. Um, and of course, I would like to, uh, uh, give a special thanks to our sponsors, uh, Air Canada, Maple Bear, CEO Lab, and Empathy. Once again, thank you all for attending tonight. Uh, thank you, merci, obrigado. Thank you. And maybe I should add, I will make the slides available. If some of you want the slides, uh, you can ask the organizers and they, they will forward them to you. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions about the admission process at EDM, I just put uh, my email address on chat. Uh, we also have a website in Portuguese and I put the link on the chat as well. And this presentation as well as this class will be in YouTube. So we can send you by email. And uh, I see some questions about the certificate. Uh, we'll send uh, to you by the end of the week. Thank you very much. Bonne soirée. Au revoir. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.